Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today. We have a few guests joining us, and you're going to hear from them shortly. Um, we're going to share, obviously, information about cases and hospitalizations, but we also have some information um, about a rental assistance program that starts today, uh, and we're going to get to them uh, in just a moment. As you all know, on Tuesday, we welcomed the Vice President, uh, Admiral Burks, but also Administrator Verma uh, and Admiral Girard and other members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, such as um, uh, folks who, who were traveling with them and Secretary DeVos was here I as well. We had some productive meetings on everything from testing to opening schools to therapeutic treatments and remdesivir, convalescent plasma transfusions. We talked about the progress being made um, on vaccine development and, and so forth. Um, and then on the previous day, we had FEMA Administrator uh, Peter Gaynor here in Baton Rouge that we were able to meet with. Uh, and so we were able to, to uh, have discussions with all of these individuals about COVID-19 about and, and with respect to Administrator Gaynor about um, preparations for uh, the remainder of hurricane season. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, it was it was uh, beneficial for us to have those discussions and to hear directly from folks like the vice president and particularly Dr. Burks uh, about the importance of mitigation measures to slow the spread, especially when nobody uh, wants to go back to phase one or phase zero, the stay at home order in order to slow the spread. Really, the only way to do that in a in an environment like we have in Louisiana today. Uh, with so much community spread of COVID-19 with high positivity uh, rates on testing uh, and so forth is the um, uh, universal or mandate, I should say, on, on mask usage, but also limiting crowd size and closing bars. Uh, obviously, you all heard the vice president say on numerous occasions that he supports those efforts, as does the president. Uh, and and I, I think the reasons for them uh, are all borne out by the numbers. And unfortunately, uh, the numbers are not getting better. Today, we added 2,284 new cases. That was on 22,300, I'm sorry, 22,937 tests. This week, we surpassed 1 million tests. And in fact, um, thus far, we're at 1 million, uh, basically 24,000. Uh, tests, which is number two in the country in per capita uh, testing. In the month of July, we have completed more than 295,000 uh, tests, uh, and for the additional tests uh, that have been administered in the month of July, that's actually number one in the country. Uh, and I say that to let people know we're working really hard because testing is critically important to know how much COVID we have, where it is, who's got it, identifying contacts and making sure these people isolate uh, and so forth and that we, we can do what we can to allow them to stay home. Um, but we obviously uh, are not, not doing everything that we would like to do. And we're going to continue to do everything we can to further surge our testing capacity in Louisiana and to reduce turnaround uh, times on those results to make our contact tracing more effective in isolation and, and, and so forth. Since July 6th, um, a total of two, I'm sorry, 20,577 Louisianans have visited one of the HHS surge test sites here in the Baton Rouge area. Um, and there are four of those that are principal sites. We have some mobile uh, testing that's part of that effort too that, that moves around, but the four fixed sites are at the F.G. Clark Activity Center on Southern's campus, Alex Box on LSU's campus, Cortana Mall, and then at the Lamar Dixon facility uh, out in Ascension Parish in, in Gonzales. So we, we've got some, some good news on that, um, that we have 60,000 tests uh, that were made available from the federal government for that effort. Those uh, Sites were scheduled at one point to close on the 18th of July. They're going to remain open now until we use all 60,000 of those tests. Uh, and we are also going to be able to deploy beyond the Baton Rouge area, uh, get into Acadiana and, and Lake Charles areas as well. More information about those specific sites will be 
will be coming up. But I do want to encourage everyone to take advantage of this free testing. Uh, results come in within two to three days and you do not have to have a symptom. You do not have to have a contact with someone who is COVID positive. Uh, anyone can get a test just because they are worried uh, that they may have COVID. So I'd encourage everybody to take ad advantage of this opportunity. You can go online to do I need a COVID-19 test.com. Do I need a COVID-19 test uh, dot com and then you could pre-register although pre-registering is not uh, e necessary either you can just show up uh, and be tested today we are also tragically reporting 24 new deaths bringing the number to 3,375 with respect to hospitalizations we added 32 individuals to the hospitals uh, since yesterday's report we're now over 14 hundred individuals who are in patient um, at, at hospitals across the state because of COVID-19 and that is um, is up uh, considerably since since mid-May um, in fact it's uh, more than double uh, since since then so we we've got some some work to do obviously uh, the numbers bear that out and speaking of numbers, we thought you might benefit today from hearing some data from uh, the private sector. Uh, so Samesh Nigam, who is a senior vice president and chief data and analytics officer for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, is going to come up and present some, some information to you all uh, and talk about what their data is revealing. And then uh, when he completes uh, his, his presentation, I will come back up uh, and, and uh, finish up my remarks as well. Samesh. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, this very deep partnership with Louisiana Department of Health that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana has developed. Um, in fact, the partnership started even before the first case was announced in Louisiana, I recall uh, seeing in our data COVID-like illness, uh, pneumonia without flu sort of spreading all over the state. Um, the first day when Governor and Dr. Biu announced the first case early in March, um, we were able to very quickly see a cluster around Lambeth House, which was the first cluster. And since that, then, that partnership has grown. We uh, very quickly signed an agreement. We are sending all of our data to LDH. Uh, Lee Mendoza has done a fantastic job of getting all the data from different sources that they've supplied to us, and we supply all of our data that we have to, um, to Louisiana Department of Health. And interestingly, we are able to uh, fill the data gaps for each other. So for example, we have sources of data whenever hospitals and uh, institutions want to admit somebody. So you know, a lot of there have been some question about quality of data, and I want to assure you uh, that from our eyes, uh, of course, as a payer, uh, we pay you know, more than $300 million per, per month to uh, healthcare uh, services. So this data is looked at very closely, and that data that's coming to us for authorizations for inpatient admissions, for example, or admission discharge and transition notices that we get daily from the healthcare system, both outpatient and inpatient. It's very closely tracking the data that LDH has published uh, out for public for everyone to use. Very high quality data. Honestly speaking, we can't say that for some of the other states around, but we certainly can rely on the data that we have here at LDH. And indeed, we saw that initial peak that uh, right after the first case, you, you already recall that peaked sometime in late March, uh, early April, and then it started coming down the school. Uh, we, we modeled the data as well, so we saw declines uh, because of school closing and stay at home uh, orders, and we were all tracking really nicely, just like New York, um, and everything was going in the right direction. Uh, we were very happy about it. Our, our not values that you probably have heard about were coming down, but after reopening, we of course have seen the resurgence, and that's shown in LDH data, and that's also shown in Blue Cross data. So in fact, we are back up to the number of inpatient admissions that we were seeing at the peak, and our outpatient numbers, the people who are actually uh, coming to the healthcare system to uh, 
outpatient clinics with symptoms, they have actually now exceeded what, whatever we had in the earlier peak. So clearly a situation that we need to be very aware of and, and do things that make all the difference. We in fact saw, uh, curiously, when the masking guidelines came out from CDC, an immediate decline in the rate. So that's something that was very gratifying to us, that the data also showed that when you start uh, using masks, the numbers decline. I know that's what we are trying to do again, to solve for this resurgence. But my hope is that everyone will follow uh, the universal masking. Um, uh, and in fact, that will help us get the disease under control. Um, I really want to thank Alex and his team. They've done a fantastic job, and, and Governor, for this very data-driven approach that you have taken. It's, it's uh, strategy in Louisiana is driven by science. My um, career mostly was spent in the Northeast and New York and Philly area, but I can absolutely with pride say that Louisiana leads the country in this very strong private-public partnership and with the data we have. So from that perspective, we are ahead of the game. We need to apply the data. We need to make sure that we're doing all the right things. And I, I'm very confident that together we'll be able to defeat the disease. So thank you. Thank you, Samesh, and I will tell you, um, Blue Cross is, if you don't know it, they have the largest market share in the private insurance market in Louisiana, but they're also uh, one of the um, managed care organizations in the Medicaid program. So they have more data than any other insurance company in the state of Louisiana, uh, and they have a very sophisticated operation. So both from a quantity and a quality perspective, uh, the information that they have is very helpful. And I want to thank uh, Samesh and all the folks at, at Blue Cross for the work you're doing, but also for providing that data to the Department of Health so that we can then just check and make sure that what we're seeing is, in fact, accurate. <clears throat> so from those numbers, you can, you can see we still have a lot of work to do. Um, we should start seeing any day now, I suspect, uh, any impact our, to our numbers from the 4th of July uh, weekend, um, and I do want to to prepare people that we there's no real reason to expect that over the next several days or a uh, couple of weeks really that that we're going to see better numbers. I hope and pray that we do, um, but there's always a lag time between when behavior changes and when that shows up in the numbers, whether it's for good or for ill. Which brings up another point that that we talked about a lot at the outset of the initial. Uh, pandemic and, and the, the case growth, uh, and, and that is, it's the nature of a pandemic. If you wait until the numbers show that, that uh, you're imminent uh, in terms of, of overrunning your capacity to deliver health care, you've waited too late. Uh, this is like a, a huge ship, and you've got to start turning it long before uh, you would you would think is necessary in order to get it pointed in the right direction before uh, it is too late, and and that's something that we've been learning from the folks at the uh, White House Coronavirus Task Force and a lot of other experts as well. Um, this today is the fourth day of the new mask mandate and the other measures uh, that we put into place. We we uh, signed the order on that on Saturday. The order became effective on Monday, mass mandates, closure of bars, and the further limits on social gatherings. I'll tell you the state fire marshal continues to um, educate businesses and, and others on their responsibilities and to respond to complaints from members of the public who are concerned about their safety uh, when they're out and about. Um, and I do want to spend just a moment uh, directly addressing uh, the Attorney General's opinion from yesterday. Uh, let me just start by being very clear on this point. The order that I issued on Monday is in effect. It is binding. It's mandatory. Uh, nobody should be confused uh, by the opinion that was issued yesterday. And I will assure you that those measures that are contained in that order are necessary to protect public safety and promote the welfare of the people of Louisiana and they are firmly based on the authority that I have in Louisiana law, uh, based in the Constitution and statutory law as well. Um, and I will, I will also direct 
some comments to businesses across the state of Louisiana. One of the things that the legislature paid particular attention to recently uh, was trying to make sure that uh, civil liability was limited. In fact, there was immunity provided to businesses across the state of Louisiana uh, with respect to employees and customers uh, who might claim um, to have contracted the disease on their premises and so forth. Uh, and that immunity was granted in, in several bills that I signed into law. Um, but all of that immunity is contingent upon the businesses following um, the guidelines of the CDC. Uh, and if you don't honor those guidelines, then, then you, there's, you run a very real risk of not having the protections uh, uh, that the law affords you with respect uh, to those liability limitations. And so I think the Attorney General's opinion uh, was wrong on many fronts, but in every front actually, uh, but it could also cause confusion uh, to business owners in a way that would um, potentially cost them a benefit of, of the laws that were passed uh, just recently. And I'm asking uh, that people comply, and I guess when it's in a mandatory order, um, it's more than asking. Uh, but whether you comply because you are worried about losing your, your immunity or whether you do it because it's the right thing to do, and I assure you it's the right thing to do, uh, whatever your motivation, um, just, just need people to, to follow the rules. Um, Dr. Birch was very clear on Monday, uh, publicly and privately. Given the amount of COVID in Louisiana today, how widespread it is with, um, by her information, uh, on Monday, 44 parishes having positivity factor of more than 10%. Uh, we know that 61 of the 64 parishes have high incidence rates of COVID cases of more than 100 per 100,000 over the last 14 days. That the only way to get back on top of this virus without going back to a stay at home order or to phase one is to have a universal mask mandate, to close bars and to limit gathering sizes. That's precisely what we did. Uh, it was sort of fortuitous that that became effective on the day of her, of her visit. Uh, so just want to encourage people uh, to, to understand where we are. We've got a lot of work to do. Everybody has a role to play. Yesterday we launched the Frontline Worker Fund. Uh, we've already received as of just before I walked in here about 125,000 applications. Uh, we should surpass the 200,000, and that's the cap on how many of these $250 awards that we can actually um, make uh, before we exhaust the, the, uh, the funding that's available for it. Um, but uh, we should, we should uh, exceed that 200,000 either today or tomorrow, so I am encouraging people uh, to apply uh, as quickly as they can. We do know that the $250 in terms of the monetary amount isn't enough uh, for these people who, who kept working and made sure that society kept functioning and that the most essential things were available to uh, the people of Louisiana, but it is what we can afford. It's what the legislature uh, chose to do with $50 million of CARES Act funding. Uh, so if you've not yet applied and you're an eligible frontline worker, and to find out whether you're eligible, you can get more information um, online as well. And we do encourage you to apply online because that's the fastest way to, to do it. And it is sort of a first come, first serve uh, program. So you can go to frontlineworkers.la.gov, frontlineworkers.la.gov to apply. Uh, we do have announcement today on rental assistance as well. The Louisiana Housing Corporation in partnership with the state Louisiana Office of Community Development uh, has created the Louisiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program to provide up to $24 million in emergency rental assistance to uh, residents facing financial hardship uh, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the program is available to start taking applications today. Uh, this too will be administered on a first come first serve basis. Uh, the initial round of funding uh, to kickstart the program is $7 million, which is immediately available. 
we anticipate additional funding uh, soon uh, for the remainder of the additional $17 million for the total of $24 uh, million. We know that there are thousands of Louisiana citizens who will likely need assistance in addition to the funds that we have. And so we're going to continue to look for additional funding out of CDB community development block grant uh, allocations not yet made to Louisiana, but authorized under the previous uh, CARES Act, uh, but other funding opportunities that may come down, including phase four of the legislation that Congress uh, should take up at the end of this month. Um, and hopefully there will be some funding there uh, for uh, rental assistance programs as well. This program is designed to help renters who've experienced financial hardship as a result of shutdowns, closures, layoffs, reduced working hours, or unpaid leave due to the pandemic. So all of those individuals are encouraged to apply. The program can also provide financial assistance to Louisiana renters who are not current on their rent and are at imminent risk of eviction uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, eligible renters uh, will have payments made on their behalf to their landlords. So these payments do not go to the renters, but they'll go directly to the landlords. The payment amount depends upon income, household size, and fair market rent prices. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is call up Keith Cunningham of the Louisiana Housing Corporation. He's going to describe the program in more detail. We have from the Office of Community Development, Pat Forbes, here today. He will answer any questions you might have uh, about the, the funding, uh, specific funding that has been made available uh, for this and what we're trying to get online uh, going forward. But I'm going to ask Keith to come up now and, and tell you more about the program. Uh, and then on the back side of his presentation, I will come up to conclude my remarks. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for an opportunity to come and talk about this very uh, important program, much needed program, the Louisiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, this program is done, in, as the Governor indicated, in conjunction with several partners. Uh, the main compo component of that is the $7 million originally available for this program. The program will be accessed through a 211 service. That 211 service that is currently in use to provide information can be used to access information regarding this program. There's also a website, louisianarenthelp.com, which will also be an opportunity for individuals who are in need of rental assistance um, to go to that website and begin the application process. Uh, currently, the program is available to individuals who are at 30% or below average median income. And what that represents in the state of Louisiana is for a household of one, 13,000, all the way up to 25,000 for households of four or more. Um, and again, this program is designed to help those individuals who, on, who are unable to pay their rent due to impacts of COVID-19, the closures, um, and the isolation and self-quarantine related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are some individuals who will not be able to participate in the program, and I want to be clear. Individuals who are already receiving governmental rental assistance will not be applicable to this program. Individuals who are living uh, in public housing will not be applicable to this program. Uh, but individuals who are experiencing difficulty and who do meet those qualifications will have an opportunity on a first-come, first-served basis to receive that benefit. That benefit will allow for three months of rental payment uh, moving forward and three months of back rental payment as additional emergency solution grant dollars are made available to the program. Again, this is an opportunity for us to help those individuals who need assistance paying their rent, but this is not an indication that an individual does not have to meet that obligation. If you are behind in your rent, if you do have issues with your rental payment, please make sure you contact your landlord. Please make sure you keep in contact with those individuals as you work through this process. Even as this program is offered, um, we don't want to indicate that there's any assurance against anyone having to pay their rent. That burden still exists. This opportunity is to help those who have that need to meet that burden. Um, and the last thing I want to make sure that we mention about the program is that as it is on a first come first serve basis, uh, we intend to allocate this money in a judicious fashion very efficiently, but we're also aware that the dollars will be made available. And so we'll try to continue to operate this program in a way to provide the assistance that individuals need throughout the state. Um, Governor, there's additional questions we'll be ready to answer, uh, but for now that is the, the gist of the entirety of the program.
Thank you. And Keith will come back in just a moment. And again, if you have questions about um, the details of the currently available funding or what we're looking at going forward, um, Pat Forbes will be here um, as well to, to answer any questions that you might have about that. Um, obviously, Louisiana remains at a very critical stage of our COVID-19 response. Uh, we can turn this around again. We've done it once. And in fact, the vice president remarked the other day that of all 50 states, uh, Louisiana is the one uh, that, that uh, had the steepest uh, growth in cases to begin with, flatten the curve, and now in this second resurgence uh, is is uh, dealing with this. And and so he, he too had confidence that we in Louisiana would do what's necessary in order to flatten the curve. I, I believe we are going to do this again, but I know we can't do it without everybody playing the part that they have to play. I do uh, want to let you all know that, that uh, every couple of three weeks, I have a uh, the opportunity to have a conference call with hundreds of pastors across uh, the state of Louisiana. Uh, and uh, last week we had s uh, such a call and received a request that I'm happy to honor today. Uh, and and it's I know it's a little bit unusual, but but uh, I think uh, it's it's something that's it's important, at least for me and those people on the call and, and many other Louisianans. So I'm going to call for three days of fasting and prayer for our state for July 20th through the 22nd. Uh, so that's the, the 20th, the 21st, the 22nd. Uh, this will be the spiritual diet and exercise uh, that, that uh, I, as a Catholic Christian, believe is very important anyway. So we'll be doing lunch fasting um, for those three days and, and certainly uh, praying as well. Praying for the people of Louisiana, praying for those who are sick, praying for those who care. Uh, for those who, who are sick and certainly uh, praying for the families of those who have passed on. So if you're inclined, please join me and the First Lady and faith leaders across Louisiana, regardless of your denomination or um, your religion. And we would ask that you uh, join us in prayerful reflection uh, and fasting. Again, it's lunch fasting on those three days. Uh, at this point in time, um, I'm just going to remind everyone, we know how to be good neighbors. It's time to, to do that in Louisiana again. Um, and if we will do that, we're going to get through this sooner and, and better. Um, and with less people becoming sick, less people entering our hospitals and taxing our health care delivery system, and certainly with less people dying. We'll also do it uh, in a way that will allow us to have more of our economy open, more of our schools open, and have as much normalcy as possible uh, before we do fully get back to normal at some point in the future. And I'm optimistic that we can do this and that we will do it. So with that, I'm going to take your questions. I do have Dr. Biu here to answer uh, questions uh, today as well uh, as the individuals that, that have already spoken. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, uh, I would tell them what I, what I said on Saturday. Uh, that is not a decision that I wanted to make. It's very, very difficult. Uh, but I do think it's, it's absolutely necessary in order to protect the public health uh, and make sure that we do, again, get back in front of this virus, that we flatten the curve and reduce the demand on our health care delivery system. And ultimately, we're going to save lives. Um, clearly, I don't like uh, relish restricting any business of any kind, and that's particularly true of, of shutting them down. Um, but it is very, very clear across the world, across the country, here in Louisiana, uh, that bars and, and uh, have contributed significantly to case growth, uh, and that's borne out uh, by the contact tracing that we've done. We have traced more outbreaks and more cases to bars than to any other setting. And that's true despite the fact that all of phase zero and phase one, they were closed. Um, and, and it's also uh, true that it's a best practice recommendation uh, coming from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, on Monday's call with the nation's governors, Dr. Burks, who then came to Louisiana the next day on Tuesday of this week and repeated the same thing, um, 
included uh, three things as being best practices right now for states like Louisiana, and those are uh, mask mandates, bar closures, and limiting crowd sizes. And so it's not something that we want to do. Um, certainly, we feel for them. We, we really do hope uh, that the ability to have curbside pick up, um, it will, will be something that they can take advantage of. We know that that's not going to offer them the full range of, of services that they're accustomed to and, and, and so forth. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, very difficult decisions have to be made. Uh, and, and this is just one of those. Yes, sir. Well, for, first of all, that's the first I've ever heard of it. Uh, I can't answer whether LEH has heard of anything uh, happening uh, like this. And, but I, the good news is I have Dr. Bu here. Uh, he can he can come up and and uh, I, I assume you you heard his question. Okay, Dr. Bu will come up and, and address it. So uh, thanks for the question. I'll tell you that we have heard that it's usually. I know a person whose cousin said that's the way that we get those questions. We have not any credible reports of that. Um, uh, certainly, I think what we've seen in the last week is across social media a campaign to try to erode public trust in testing in general. I think those stories are a good example of that. I think questions that are raised about whether the Department of Health is uh, uh, listing cases as every positive test that's run, which is not the case. If you're a case on our board, it means that you have been tested at least once as a positive. If you're tested 12 more times, we don't add you 12 more times, you're just still that one case. These kinds of stories, I think, are, are, are insidious and pernicious and, and, quite frankly, scary from a public health standpoint, because I don't think that there is um, uh, a widespread effort uh, to raise uh, numbers. We certainly have nothing to gain from that. Uh, what uh, there is a risk of, though, is people um, uh, feeling that, that testing doesn't work or that they don't want to get tested, because um, testing is the key beginning point to understanding your risk and the community's risk for COVID, having people know that they need to isolate, take care of their health, and for people who might have been exposed to that individual, know that they also need uh, to quarantine. Um, so, so again, we, we don't have any credible reports of that, but we hear a lot of rumors. Um, and I would just emphasize, uh, again, we've been very transparent with our data and, and would encourage people to reach out to the Department of Health where they have questions. Sam. Red River Parish and also West Louisiana Parish have made um, essentially these claims that they have a, some sort of list of cases, right, and they believe there's duplicates on them. I think Mike Johnson, the congressman, uh, actually posted about it today. So can you address that specifically, uh, I guess the Red River Parish instance? Sure. So um, uh, early in the epidemic, uh, many states, including Louisiana, uh, began sharing uh, information specifically with uh, first responders, and it's really in the first responder systems that that information is supposed to be listed, so that as people were responding to calls, they would know whether uh, the individual that they had interacted with posed um, uh, a risk of spreading COVID, kind of like an early contact tracing uh, specific to first responders. Part of the data sharing uh, agreement that we had uh, with individuals was that that data really was not for somebody to just pour over and look at. Uh, it was specifically to be entered into that system so that as somebody is dispatched, they would only have visibility in the person that they're responding to. Um, we continue that practice to this day. Uh, what I believe we're seeing from Red River Parish uh, Office of uh, Emergency Preparedness uh, is looking at their data, they feel that there um, are duplicate cases. Um, and, and I think it's probably just a misunderstanding on their part. Um, we've changed the way that we give that data. We now only provide new cases. I think in their posting, they noted that they're looking at a cumulative list. They're not. Um, and we uh, hand uh, both, both automated, automatedly and manually deduplicate, as we've talked about before, move out of state people out of state, move out of parish people out of parish every day. And when we looked at uh, Red River Parish's numbers uh, at the time of, of uh, their posting, uh, they did have 96 cases. 
Um, and we were not able to uh, uh, corroborate what they feel uh, is, I think, something as low as 56 cases. So I, I do think we have a call set up uh, early next week to, to um, hopefully have a, a productive discussion, which was what I hope would have happened at the beginning about data. I know that there's many questions about that data, but again, I go back to the importance, especially as public officials, of giving sound uh, public um, uh, information in the middle of a pandemic and not raising undue concern. Please. Yeah, to be clear, you are only ever a case once. Uh, so you test positive. If we test you every day for the next 10 days or however many, you may have 10 tests reported. I would not recommend that since we're feeling a pinch on tests. Uh, but you are only once listed as a case. Now, there are times because of the way that um, uh, sister hospitals may report their labs uh, twice to us, uh, that, that that data may initially show up twice in our system, and that's why we have an automated system and a manual system to go through and, and remove anybody that's listed twice. And sometimes it's as simple as uh, Robert being listed as Bob uh, in the next lab. And so it takes something your computer can do and something that a human eye has to do to identify those are two people. But no, you are listed as a case once no matter how many tests you have. I do want to sort of follow up on something else you said there, which is some employers are requiring people to test negative before returning. We are strongly recommending that that not be the practice. And in fact, when the Vice President and Ambassador Burks were here, they also emphasized that. With the strains that we're seeing on access to testing uh, facilities, um, it is not appropriate to test otherwise healthy people to prove negativity uh, for COVID-19. Really, you have to be a vulnerable uh, nursing home uh, resident or somebody who is otherwise particularly ill that we have concern or immunocompromised that we have concerned you may not shed us um, uh, clear the virus as quickly for us to think you need to be retested. Most of the public, once positive, should be symptom-free for at least three days, more than 10 days after their positive test, and that is all that they need to be able to return back to uh, work and, and what other uh, uh, engagement they do with the public. With a mask on, please. <clears throat> So, so we're not currently recommending something like that. When we look at gating criteria, we're really looking at, at a state policy level, movement into a phase, um, and, and potentially movement back in phases. I think even that, we're in a, a bit of an interesting moment where that paradigm is shifting. Um, and you see that in the governor's latest order. We now have information uh, and evidence from our own contact tracing, from studies done across the country, obser observed during this epidemic that tell us we may not necessarily have to go back to a stay-at-home order if we can emphasize you know, the following things, because these were the things that seemed to have the biggest impact. Ambassador Burks is working with a team at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia modeling, and uh, the measures that she gave as recommendations to the state, certainly to our governor, um, were designed so that you could keep the economy open while uh, apparently keeping below a reproductive number of one. Uh, we haven't seen that data. I can't corroborate that, but that's the way that it's been explained to us. And so what I would say going forward for schools or whoever else is that as we have specific information, whether it's uh, the risk of bars, whether it's the uh, benefit of masks, that I think is important for them to operate on. Um, and, and certainly there's always the risk that as a state, if our numbers uh, in our hospitals get out of control, that would be something where we would need a cooling off period. But, but to be clear, we now are in a, a situation where we can act on best evidence. And, and the, the, I know I'm going long on this, and the last thing I'll say about best evidence is just this week the CDC released a study about mask wearing, um, highlighting the work of two hairstylists in Missouri both of whom uh, were actively shedding COVID, unaware of their status because of a turnaround on, time on tests, both of whom, according to Missouri rules, wearing masks and all of their clients wearing masks. And over the course of eight days of, hair, of cutting hair together, uh, they interacted with 136 different individuals, including people, coworkers, as well as people whose hair they cut. Not a single one of them went on to get COVID. I cannot underemphasize the importance of wearing masks the CDC and the federal government and even um, uh, the White House uh, uh, are, are now very clear 
that there's a reason we're saying wear your masks. It is going to make a difference between you potentially exposing somebody or being exposed. So it, it's a good question. I do not have that specific information, but we'd be happy to follow up with you and we can talk with our epidemiologists and get that for you. So in, in the Baton Rouge surge uh, testing sites, there's a, a, specific, a specific, specific emphasis being placed in Baton Rouge on trying to suppress both symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, spread. That's, that's what the federal sort of uh, setup of that system is. They've uh, given us the access to the test. They're um, driving a lot of the protocols that we're using. So it's a unique situation there. Um, I think what I'm saying more broadly is that in, in other uh, parts of the state, especially places where we're seeing uh, high numbers of cases and maybe uh, limitations on the specific, um, uh, you know, specimens that are able to be processed in those areas. I'm thinking of like the Lake Charles area um, uh, and other parts of the state. Uh, we don't want to encourage uh, unnecessary testing. And, and what we've done in the Office of Public Health is essentially a tiered uh, listing of different categories of people who could need tests, very similar to what we had in the early days of the uh, epidemic. We don't want to have to dial those back, but we develop that so that if we do have to, in specific regions or specific areas, make sure that there are adequate tests for very ill people in the hospital, for first responders, things like that. We're not just doing that without a system. We have a system where we can sort of dial up and down based on access to testing. We, uh, uh, after the, the conversations with the Vice President and Ambassador Burks, are hopeful that we've got some strategies that will help us uh, once again see more testing access uh, across the state and allow us to be in a situation where we really can test all comers as we've been doing. Um, but we have to be cognizant of uh, if we are in a situation where there's uh, uh, constraints, making sure that we prioritize tests for those people who um, uh, most direly need them. Yes, please. So uh, I believe people who are working in congregate settings, for instance, uh, we operate uh, the, the uh, state uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has uh, veterans homes. They are testing their staff, just as we're recommending that all nursing home uh, staff be tested, and as is the, the federal government. Uh, so I think they at least are being tested uh, relatively frequently. I don't know an exhaustive list of everybody who's being repeatedly testing. Um, we have um, uh, staff uh, in our state facilities as well, the, I'm sorry, the Department of Health's uh, state hospitals that are also uh, in a cycle of, of retesting as well. Maybe the, the last question for me. <laughs> So I don't have an answer for you on that. I'll say, um, you know, the, the R values that we, that we track, the reproductive number, how likely it is that any one individual or how many uh, new individuals will become infected by a single individual that's infected um, uh, is going to be managed by a lot of different factors. And just as you heard uh, the governor say, uh, that data is going to lag the actual um, uh, implementation of policies. So I, I don't have an answer for you on, on that today. Um, but we, we do have um, uh, data that's, that's a little bit more timely in the forms of cases and symptoms, uh, and that's driving a lot of our, of our decision making these days. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you could see when we were saying we had an R naught of one or lower, you also saw the number of active cases, at least by those that we had tested, uh, going down over time. Uh, over the last few weeks, you've seen it going up over time. When you subtract uh, the total cases from the total cases, those people who are presumed recovered, uh, so we know that we're well above one, and that's being reflected in the cases, the the uh, the positivity, um, and ultimately in in hospitalizations and deaths. And getting back to your question a while ago, uh, these were three federally sponsored 
uh, surge sites uh, across the country uh, where a special emphasis was made on getting into hotspots and trying to arrest those hotspots with a very comprehensive uh, testing plan for, for surge capacity and testing uh, up to 5,000 uh, per day here in Baton Rouge. But there were only two others in the country, McAllen, Texas, and Jacksonville, Florida. And only in, in, in the context of those testing sites have I seen where they said, come if you think you've got it. If you're symptomatic, come if you think you've been in contact with someone who had it, come for any reason. And, and they, are, they are calling the shots on that. And by the way, we very much appreciate the fact that they're in Baton Rouge. I will tell you that the Department of Corrections uh, routinely tests uh, staff members uh, as well. Uh, so, so we are paying particular, the question getting back to state employees uh, who are being uh, routinely tested regardless of, of symptoms, it's those who work in these congregate settings and whether they're, they're uh, prisons, uh, nursing homes uh, and the like. So, yes, sir. Well, I think the chronology of the events that you just uh, listed in your question explain those guidelines came out after I announced the decision. So are you planning on following those guidelines? Well, we're going to take a look at them like like we always do uh, and see whether we believe those things are needed. I I will tell you, uh, everything that we've done thus far has been consistent with guidelines we've gotten from CDC and the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, whether it was the gating criteria, uh, the mitigation measures that we put in place at different points in time. So clearly we, we will take a look at, at, at this as well. Um, the, the things that were emphasized uh, Monday uh, by Dr. Burks, Burks and um, uh, the vice president dealt with masks, uh, limitation on, on crowd size and, and, and closing bars. But we'll, we will certainly take a look at these, these other things too uh, and see whether we think that, that those are additional steps that we have to take. I can tell you as I stand here right now, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, of a mindset where we are about to, to impose new uh, restrictions. You know, we, we are mindful that we have a current proclamation that is set to expire on the 26th. And there will be a, a new proclamation issued um, in order to take its spot. I cannot commit today what will be in that, in that one that comes on the 26th. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. All right, so um, any, any other questions for me? I might just leave, uh, I might just leave Keith and, and Pat and Samesh here to, to answer your questions. Uh, look, th- thank you all for continuing to cover this. The information uh, is that, that gets out uh, from you all uh, to the Louisiana people is incredibly important. And, and that's because there are a lot of sources of information out there that are just misinformation, uh, just wrong. Uh, sometimes it's, 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 it's wrong but without being malicious, and sometimes it's malicious. Uh, but the, the way that we combat that is to put out good information. And, and you all play a critical role in that. And so I want to thank you for doing that. And I want to continue to encourage the people of Louisiana uh, to play the role that we have. Let's wear our mask uh, when we're out of our house and we're uh, interacting with people who are not part of our immediate household. Let's make sure that we're washing hands, staying home uh, when we're sick, uh, and keeping that six foot of physical separation between ourselves and others. Uh, and in addition to those things, Uh, I do continue to ask people to pray for our state. And again, I would ask you to join uh, with me with a lunch fasting uh, and prayer on July 20th, 21st, uh, and 22nd. So thank you. And I'm going to leave these other folks uh, behind to answer, answer more questions.